for me because it's the opening of our new exhibition down here called Coherence, an immersive laser installation by Dan Corson. And so, of course, we're starting with tonight's lecture, but before we get to that, I wanted to take a minute to thank several of the donors to the exhibit. Um, there were several people that sponsored the exhibit. We're very grateful for that. Um, the Neva Peterson Endowment for the Christian Peterson Art Museum was one. The Estate of Shirley Hell, Kathy and John Hell, Peter and Ray Riley, the College of Engineering on campus, the College of Design and Exhibitions Committee on campus, and then we did have some in-kind donations from businesses in town, the Art Pet Shop as well as Country Plastics. Um, so we're very grateful to their support because without that, you guys wouldn't be able to experience what you're about to experience tonight. So this lecture, we're going to start with a lecture by Dan. Um, it was also co-sponsored by the ISU Committee on Lectures and was co or is co-hosted by the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers on campus. So with that, I'm going to introduce Allie, G Allie Gillette. I've been changing her last name all that whole evening. But Allie Gillette is going to introduce Dan. So please welcome her. Wires that glow um, made of uh, 
electroluminescent cable that are suspended over the top that kind of are in this very um, meticulously hand wrought uh, topographic sort of view of, uh, of this cave. What I was looking at doing is kind of creating a cave that was a cave but was not a cave. So if you actually took the real topography of a cave and you kind of created it out of that metal and then you projected it in space, it would look like this mishmash of a whole bunch of confusing things. So what I did is I kind of morphed a number of these different profiles of different parts of the cave from one to the other to give this kind of sense of complex um, patterning, but gave it a sense of calmness. And I think that's one of the things that I tried to infuse in uh, at least this work. Um, and then, of course, I put a uh, reflecting pond in the bottom. So uh, at the museum, at the gallery space, they always expected this to be really an eyes up show. Everything was going to be kind of looking up. But they turned out that uh, many people were really mesmerized with kind of what was actually happening in the water plane below and in the reflections. Um, and of course, um, I also had to uh, kind of put some drips. So every so often, there would be water drops that would kind of happen and distort the, uh, the cave. And so that's kind of where the name uh, grotesque actually comes from. It's about the distortion of the image uh, through a uh, grotto in a cave um, where you see these distortions. Uh, so I actually used the same kind of theatrical filters on these windows for this vibrating indigo piece. Um, and what I did is I used the natural daylight and transformed the daylight by putting these filters on it. And that caused these individual strands that were painted with fluorescent paint and black paint to actually fluoresce. So it's really hard to see here the way that the camera captures things. but. Uh, these, these pieces actually, each one of the bands that you see there actually would kind of glow and kind of vibrate in space in front of you. So it had this very kind of interesting phenomenological optical experience. Um, I thought I'd show a bunch of kind of work that I'm doing currently um, and stuff in the past. Um, and this piece, Shifting Topographies, is actually opening up next week in Oakland, California. Um, I do mostly public works. Uh, and this piece was inspired by the, um, all the kind of the adjacency to uh, the Oakland Bay, uh, the San Francisco Bay, and the, the rolling Oakland Hills. And I wanted to uh, create something uh, that animated this space. So I was given this palette of this entire alleyway, and it was also a bar entrance. Um, and it's actually a, a fairly nasty place. Um, and you know, a lot of people you're going to be there in the middle of the evening. Uh, it's a kind of really charming location. But the, the interesting thing is, like on either side, it's anchored by two large, uh, famous theaters, and it's also become this budding nightclub area. So. Uh, the, what I did is I kind of uh, took this and we're kind of transforming it like this. So this piece is actually kind of interesting in that it's made from um, kind of these kind of topographic patterns. But um, the, the thing is it actually changes all during the day and the night. So they asked me to create a, 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 an artwork that was kind of light based but was mostly visible during the daytime. If you've ever tried to kind of outshine the sun with a flashlight, you will know how successful that is. Um, so what I did is I really thought about uh, light and color and how we're actually seeing things. And I tried to kind of infuse that into the piece. So taking cue from Mother Nature, uh, the morpho butterfly there um, is actually, uh, you know, you've seen them in the tropical forests and there are these like brilliant blue colors. But uh, it actually has no pigment whatsoever. Uh, it's kind of like uh, the rainbow in that it's reflecting, refracting light at a certain wavelength back into your eye. And uh, it's, so, so actually when you see it as, a, as an element, it's actually clear. Um, this artwork next to it is the same thing. It's one color. Uh, it's a type of paint, 
but as you see it at different angles, it actually uh, transforms. And you know, it's also like those hot rods, the, the colors of you know, uh, those cars that you can kind of uh, see shifting color. Well, it's the same kind of technology. So this is the same part of the wall, just from looking at it from this side and from this side. So it completely transforms from blue to green as you walk by. Uh, and you know, all this within the shadows, and, and all during the day it shifts and becomes really different. And as you walk by, it's actually you get this kind of view of this green spotlight essentially in front of you, and then it kind of slowly fades off to blue and purple on the side. And as you walk through the space and keep on looking, it's this follow spot of green that follows with you as you walk through the space. So. Um, in the evening, uh, because of the adjacency of the theater, we are kind of creating uh, additional kind of patterning to kind of keep this topographic um, uh, uh, feeling and this kind of sense of movement. And we have this uh, this lighting display that kind of goes over the surface. Here we've actually taken the, the same kind of topo of the area, and, and part of this, by the way, the scale of this is actually derived from the site. And so we're reprojecting the site back onto uh, itself and then kind of distorting it. Um, some of the things are kind of more nebula-like, but it kind of really engages the space. And hopefully it's not going to have um, a lot of people hanging out there uh, for, well, what they did before. <laughs> um, in adjacent, in addition to that, we have these kind of uh, lowered areas. Let's see, you can see at the back where um, here and on the other side, uh, there are, are, are large walls that are kind of uh, doing the ventilation for the, um, the bark system down below. And so what we're doing is we're covering the walls uh, with very thick cobalt blue glass that has kind of ribbons of mylar inside of it. And the ribbons of mylar kind of take the form of the topography. So you can see how these two forms kind of start playing off of each other. And as you walk by, you, see, you are reflected kind of in all those remaining little ribbons. So it kind of further activates things. And then we actually have uh, the city grid um, right adjacent to it, where we can actually kind of locate ourselves kind of within the kind of urban topography of the city. So yeah, take right. Um, this is a project that was opened a little while ago in Seattle, uh, Sonic Bloom. Uh, it was uh, commissioned by the Pacific Science Center, um, which is kind of a children's museum uh, space behind. Uh, the piece is actually uh, giant kind of photo cells on the top. They bring energy inside. They go into the grid. We kind of use the same amount of electricity at night to uh, kind of create lighting for the piece. Um, and then we also are expressing the use of that electricity during the daytime in that each one of the flowers sings. So it has its own specific tone that actually sounds like a human choral voice. Uh, all in the key of uh, D and D major and D minor. And, and so as you approach each individual flower, it will sing a tone. So you can actually have choreography where you're kind of directing your friends to step up and go back and kind of create music this way. Um, and then it goes through a, a number of cycles kind of in the evening. Um, and um, the barcodes themselves are, um, well, actually the patterns are barcodes, and so they all mean something. And so if you're very clever, you can kind of figure that out. Hopefully those folks in the Science Center would be interested in doing that. Um, but you can see there are kind of some of the solar cells on top of the flowers. And I always like to kind of show the scale of these things and, and that it really takes a huge crew of people to make these things come true. So here are the, the solar cells, and uh, I'm kind of loading them up on top. So these are um, about uh, 40 feet tall and 20 feet across. Um, the nice part about them is we have a lot of cloudy days in Seattle. So I wanted to allow these things to glow during the daytime. So kind of all these kind of ribbon petals 
are um, frosted uh, acrylic, and they're so they really kind of pick up the light, and when you look up, they would kind of uh, show in a really nice way. If they were just a transparent red, it wouldn't do the same sort of thing. But this way, they actually glow during the day, and they glow nicely in the evening as well. So uh, I've, I'm a real weird plant geek. I love all sorts of weird plants, and I've got this weird thing going on with nepenthes. Um, so nepenthes are kind of this uh, type of carnivorous plant. Um, and what was also interesting is that um, the name itself, you know, from the ancient Greeks, was this kind of magical potion that was to relieve pain and sorrow and suffering. Um, and I just liked that as uh, the idea of like a community that kind of would like to have something kind of fun to look at and kind of lift their spirits. So this was done for this really quirky neighborhood in Portland. Uh, and I had four of them. And uh, they are covered with solar cells on the top. And you can see during the daytime, the solar cells kind of cast these patterns that go down the neck of the sculptures. They're about 18 feet tall. And they kind of march down the street. Um, every block has one. So in the evening, kind of they light up with the solar cells, and you get just this chance to kind of follow your way down through uh, the area. They all have their own personalities. <coughs> um, and I was kind of asked to uh, reuse the form in a new way. Uh, and I was able to do that because it was actually in another country. Uh, <laughs> so they gave me permission, and uh, we reimagined this project for a, a residential community in uh, Edmonton. And it's a, uh, it was a uh, neighborhood that was kind of developed by Brookfield Residential um, called Paisley. So the penalty is Paisley I. Um, and Paisley was the, the name, Brian Paisley was the name of the founder of their, um, uh, uh, they have a, a kind of a theatrical sort of um, event that happens every year. So uh, French festival. And so he was um, kind of the spark of that and they went to infuse the whole thing with kind of more excitement. So I kind of created this, these pieces for them. It was kind of a, a gazebo of sorts. Um, and clustered together. They have a really different feeling, but with the same forms. And um, so in the evening, they kind of very, very slowly transform color. So as you drive by, they look one way, and you drive by another time, they look something else. Um, but then when you actually enter in the space, then they become kind of even more active and kind of creep, kind of more dynamic pattern. So um, it's just one of those things that the community uh, likes that, you know, when someone's, you can see that someone's been there because kind of they're acting more active. So Iowa West Foundation, a little while ago, asked me to do a large piece over there at Council Bluffs. Um, and uh, the project was this uh, five and a half acre lawn, a uh, massive lawn out there. And uh, they really wanted to stretch the time that the park could be used to do something exciting in the evening. And so uh, they asked me to do some special thing by uh, incorporation of the lawn. And I came up with this idea of uh, rays, which is a, a whole series of kind of projections on the lawn that um, create kind of different environments. But these environments um, are drawn for from uh, European knot gardens in a kind of formalistic sort of way, and also the breaking up of the ice flows from the adjacent river. So you get these kind of patterns that kind of swirl and move through the space. Um, and uh, the way it's designed is at the beginning and at the end, there are kind of pre-programmed sequences. And in the middle, we have this interactive sort of sequence. So we've got robotic lights kind of all the way uh, on all four corners. And then we have uh, motion sensors and detectors and uh, video cameras that kind of identify where people are. And through this kind of complex um, system, we're actually able to play games with visitors that come there. So there's like five very simple, fun games that people can engage with 
there's kind of this uh, rainbow that kind of goes over the field that says, okay, it's time to come out and play. And if you go out there, then uh, different things happen. So, you know, one is a, a cat and mouse or a laser cat pointer game, you know, where we kind of throw something on and some, as soon as someone runs to it, it kind of runs away. Um, we have kind of another one that's kind of uh, uh, catch the spotlight where one person is in the spotlight and then someone tries to steal that spotlight from other people. And there's a bunch of different kind of little interactive games. So it's a very fun, family-friendly sort of um, kind of performance piece. And this is the uh, Emerald Laser Lawn. This is in um, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So this uh, project actually is, again, on a lawn. And what we've done is we've taken a series of uh, green lasers and kind of shot them through the grass at a very, very low level. And one of the things that's really interesting about kind of lasers are that it will allow you to take one blade of grass and illuminate it, but not the adjacent blade of grass. So you can get these kind of remarkable effects where kind of the carpet starts crawling along in front of you, or when you see individual blades kind of lighting up, it almost looks like fire. We have to go through, because this is an unmanned project, um, we have to go through a lot of uh, security issues. Um, we have double Doppler radar systems that determine how quickly people are moving towards the site um, to protect them. And uh, we have a, a number of other kind of safety cutoffs. So the, lo the lasers are located actually underneath the park bench. like to come and kind of take their fairies home with them and uh, that's become a little bit of a problem. Uh, we, so, we, so we had to specify, specify the length that the lawn actually couldn't be cut any, you know, when it was any lower than this and had to be, you know, between this and this. So kind of working with the parks department, we were able to, you know, just kind of get it right in there. So kind of growing up these things, this is a project called Oscillating Fields that we did as a Thank you for the sound transit, um, uh, the light rail system in Seattle. This area was going to be, become a construction site for uh, two and a half years. And so we did this kind of as a public kind of pretty thank you display for them. Uh, it's a series of, um, of uh, <coughs> fiberglass rods that have tips that are kind of painted um, with a fluorescent color. Um, when they, so they're painted kind of orange. And when the green laser hits the orange, it actually turns yellow. And so you get these kind of patterns that move through. And as you see um, them hitting the yellow, it looks like there's a different set of lights that are going through and creates this kind of geography, um, kind of within the space. So this project um, is part of the project that you're going to see tonight. So we're doing this project inverted. Where, um, where uh, this will um, kind of be over your head and you'll have a chance to go through this space. Um, within this space, we actually had to kind of keep people away because the lasers were um, so powerful and blind them. So for you, we've put them overhead so you can walk through the space and still not be blinded. <laughs> I'm always thinking about you guys. Um, but you can see what's, you know, that you get kind of one blade that's lit and then the blade right next to it is not. growing even larger. Um, these are some poles for uh, sound transit, the safety spires that um, are a permanent part of the light rail system there. They kind of mark the uh, operations and maintenance area, and they were inspired by the native horsetail rush, the Ecclesium, um, which uh, the Native Americans used to kind of scrub pots and kind of use them as an abrasive. It's a project called Imperium Passage. It is a um, uh, an oculus to the heavens. If you remember your Dante, uh, he had seven layers of hell, and he also had seven layers of heaven. 
and the light or of heaven that was closest to God was the fiery level, the level that was called the Imperium. So this is the Imperium passage. It was actually designed in the same way that kind of historic hoop skirts were designed. So they actually kind of move in the wind in that same sort of way. Um, and I was always thinking that this was, you know, more of an oculus uh, to the heavens to, to kind of like bring our eyes up because everyone was so obsessed about the local starlets there. Um, being West Hollywood, everyone's like, oh, I was seeing Lindsay Lohan at lunch. Um, so uh, the, the piece kind of was a temporary piece. It was always uh, designed that way. And they extended it a little bit. And then uh, a, uh, a silver Ferrari came and hit it. And luckily, the piece was completely fine. The Ferrari, not so great. Um, but you know, it, it just hit one of the poles, and the whole thing kind of did that. Um, so it survived. Uh, this is a, a, another light rail project uh, for the city of uh, Gresham in Oregon, uh, home of the first um, uh, fair in that whole state. They have a very kind of diverse community. Um, of uh, kind of both uh, Asian communities and a strong Hispanic community that is kind of in this area. Uh, strip molly, very kind of uh, flat, so you kind of want to see things from a distance. Um, so I created these, these giant fans that kind of have a moray pattern on them as you walk by. Um, the tips glow and they kind of are always teal except for when the train comes. So when they start kind of changing colors, you know, oh, it's too late, the train's here, so I don't need to run for it. This is a project I'm working on in the city of San Jose. We're just starting fabrication for it. Um, it's, I think, going to be pretty interesting. It's two projects. Um, because they have an airport right downtown, you can't have anything up. So all of their gateways are very low and squat in the city. And they asked me to do something kind of underneath this uh, lovely underpass. And uh, so I kind of took crews uh, from their uh, adjacent kind of river and uh, the, the patterns of echoes and of raindrops and the idea of us being kind of all these individual hot spots we're all walking around with cell phones in our pockets and kind of this this pattern that's kind of surrounding us, this invisible pattern of electricity. I swear I'm not moving. Let's try this. Okay. So, um, what we're seeing is a couple of different things. We're seeing um, these things that we're, I'm calling halos, and these halos are individually controllable. Sorry, folks. How about that? Okay. Individually controllable halos, and the halos are um, kind of representative of this kind of motion and echo of space, and then we have this paint pattern that ends up happening underneath them. Now the paint pattern is all made with kind of reflective bead paint, paint as well. So as your car comes by and hits these things, they're kind of kind of pop and ripple through the space. And uh, so during the daytime, they'll have this sort of experience, and then at night time, they'll be able to kind of change the colors within these. In addition to that, what I've done is I've taken the regular street lights and I've relamped them with a type of kind of bright. off and see if I can do Okay, can you hear my voice okay? Okay, one sec. So I've relamped all the, the, the lighting with these kind of metal calorie lamps that are a, a dark blue color in the space. So it kind of uh, enhances the already kind of blue pigmented uh, reflective blue paint in the space. Uh, and it kind of creates this interesting ambiance as you walk through. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, sensors located along the pathway. So as you walk, walk into certain areas or as you ride into certain areas, you kind of set off these pre-programmed sequences. 
So in addition to that, I've been working with Google um, on their new game called Ingress. Does anyone know Ingress? It's a very <coughs> interesting uh, kind of game where you actually have to physically be at a site and you start kind of engaging with other people to, uh, it's kind of a complex game, but it's, uh, it's a way of you kind of, it's kind of like geocache stuff, but you actually have to physically be there and, and you're interacting with other people. So uh, in talking to them about this, I thought, well, there should be a way of people to be able to engage the space. So we're, we're playing it so that there will be these sequences that are normally playing, but then if you actually have this game, you can actually uh, play and the people who are kind of winning, the red team or the blue team, can actually temporarily take over the space. And uh, depending on the level you are playing at the game, different kind of frequencies, different kind of patterns will start happening in space. So uh, that's what's happening on that side. It's just a quick little study animation that we did. <coughs> Project currently in fabrication <coughs> uh, up in Canada uh, for uh, Richmond, BC. Uh, they're called um, spinners and take inspiration from a whole bunch of different areas. This area for this artwork actually used to be a um, Christmas tree plantation. So I was actually thinking a little bit about these kind of spun forms and Christmas tree ornaments and things like that when I uh, started the project and it kind of evolved to these large sculptural objects. Um, you know, it's kind of like Seattle, drizzles a lot, kind of a lot of way, wind, rain, so you want to be able to get out of the rain in this area. So I thought, well, we have these spaces, and if you could get inside and maybe turn the table in and out of the rain, then you'd have this room-side sculpture that you could actually spin around. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are at the fabrication shop, and playing around with What I did is, in thinking about the, the painting for the museum, it's all sculpted and you've got a, a light there in the center that doesn't spin, right? Because the table stays the same, you move around. Uh, and then that lights the inside at the nighttime so you can kind of feel safe and have some lighting inside.